Hello. In the first video on systems of differential equations, we focused on actually solving uh, the sorts of um, systems, i.e. simultaneous differential equations. In this video, we're going to look more at the examples, predator prey, chemical factories, pollution in the body, and even uh, pandemics, which might be quite relevant. So let's just dive in. Predator and prey. Let's look at a more realistic model of a fox and a rabbit. Here we go. So I've changed the uh, equations a bit. Left hand side's the same in that their rates of change. Right hand side, I've uh, thought about food chains. So rabbits, well, they live off plants. And the key bit here is what's written in this bracket here. Um, if the plants can support 1,000 rabbits, well, if I have uh, fewer rabbits than this, it's going to be positive, isn't it? I can have more rabbits, but if the number of rabbits goes above 1,000, then this, uh, then the number of rabbits in the population will go down because there's not enough food. So the sign of this bracket is really important in the food chain. So that's the first bit. That's just as if there were rabbits. But also, if I've got foxes, well, foxes are going to eat rabbits, so that, that's negative, so they're going to reduce the number of rabbits over time, aren't they? So that's the rabbits um, equation. Now let's look at this fox equation. Now I've got another of these brackets here. Foxes live off rabbits. They probably need to eat, say, four rabbits uh, for every one fox uh, in a period of time to stay awake. So to stay alive rather, not starve. So this bracket does the same thing as the one below. If I've got more rabbits than foxes, the pop, uh, the, fo the, the four times the foxes, the number of ra um, the number of foxes will increase. So there'll be enough food for more of them. And if this bracket is negative, the number of foxes will reduce because there's not enough food for them. So that's basically uh, improving that part of the modelling. We can now convert those into linear equations by just expanding out the brackets. And if we do that, top one looks fairly similar in form. Yeah, it's got differential in fox, rabbits and foxes. Um, same thing here with the rabbits, foxes and rabbits. But now I've got a constant of 100. That's the food supply for rabbits. So there's some sort of constant there that would keep everything stable wouldn't it if, if we had enough food for them so if we solve that for our initial conditions of only having 10 foxes and 100 rabbits a bit like we did before we get these two um, specific solutions and they look very similar to the ones we had in the first video in that i've got an exponential but this time it's a decreasing exponential and i've got a sinusoid part here but I've also got a constant now, and that co these two constants are coming as uh, out of that 100 and how we play around with the 100. So let's have a look at what this looks like graphically, shall we? Here's our graph. So what's going on here? Well, we started off with a 1,000 rabbits, didn't we? Foxes start eating them, and the number of rabbits goes down. And as the foxes are eating them, so the number of foxes goes up because there's plentiful food at that point. OK, I'm going to look back up here and see what happens. So as time becomes very large, these two terms here, the e to the um, negative 0.7 uh, t, when t goes to infinity, these two terms are heading for zero, aren't they? So what actually happens? Well, we over time, everything goes to a steady state. So we end up with 154 foxes and 615 um, rabbits, there's 615 rabbits, and there's our 154 foxes. That's what happens because these terms are all heading to zero, aren't they? So we've got a nice smooth decay here being driven by this. We're not really seeing this oscillation part because this first term set tends to zero very quickly. So we get a nice steady state at the end of it, don't we? Get a nice smooth change to a new steady state. Yep. Okay. Um, we could look at that as well by graphing one against the other. So here's the rabbits on the vertical and here's the foxes on the horizontal. What happened here? Well, we started off at this point here with 10 foxes and a thousand rabbits and then the you know, we started getting more and more foxes and less rabbits and we followed this locus around 
until we ended up here and that's almost like that's going to be our steady state position there's our 615 rabbits and um, whether it was a hundred and what was it excuse me 154 154 foxes yeah so you can see how it's for these things tend to follow a track and go somewhere okay uh, what we're going to look at here chemical factory so what's happening here well I've got some chemical reaction chamber and what's happening I'm pumping in 21 kilograms per hour of compound P it's reacting with some gas in there and what's coming out well Q is coming out our, our, rea um, our product um, is coming is being drawn off yeah so let's have a look at what these formulas are saying. The rate of change of P here is some function of the um, um, the um, some of it's being converted into Q, isn't it? So, and if there's more Q, I'm going to convert more P. And this 21 here is the amount of P that's being pumped in every hour. Yeah. So that's what's happening to my P equation. What's happening to Q? Well, if I get more P put in, I'm going to create more Q. But here, they're pumping out Q as well at the end. Um, that's our output. That's why we had the whole factory. We want to get Q out of it, yeah? So those are our two differential equations. And again, we can solve those using sort of methods we did earlier. And we get two nice exponentials here. We get two constants on the end. Um, I'm assuming that we start off with no P in there and we get a no Q inside the reaction chamber. So this is what happens over time. Here are the solutions. So what does that mean then? Let's have a look at our diagram. So we start off with no P and no Q inside the reaction chamber and they both rise up as we pump in P and as it generates Q and quite quickly within two hours that is everything stabilizes and we end up with five point inside we get 5.6 kilograms of p and we get seven kilograms of of q so we've got a nice steady state as again but actually what's important here as well is we're really interested in what's going in what's going out of this reaction reactive agent uh, reaction chamber so we were pumping in um, how much 21 kilograms in per hour of P and what's coming out well we were taking out uh, negative 5Q out of the Q equation so like, um, 8Q so 5 eighths, 7 eighths are 56 so what's going out we're pumping out 56 kilograms of Q every hour so it's working isn't it that's what we want to do is to create Q what's happening if we look at it parametrically graphing P inside the chamber with Q inside the chamber well we start off with nothing in there and what happened it followed its way again up a locus and here we've got PQ that's the amount of P and Q at five hours but you can see these points after half an hour we've got to there so a quarter of an hour we got to there we've got half an hour we got to there one hour we get to there two hours we get to there and you can see it's basically stopping there so that's our steady state isn't it there's our seven and there's our 5.6 there we go so these diagrams are quite useful seeing what's happening in these um, experiments these setups um, said about lead pollution so if I've got my body here we go I can breathe in air lead usually from petrol in the old days will come into your body it will come into your lungs through your bloodstream get pumped around your body some of it will get um, sweated out of your skin and some of it gets peed out um, but it doesn't entirely go away so what happens we get these equations here this pair this B is lead in your blood T is lead in kilograms in your tissue yeah, and these are the two equations for what's going on with it passing around the body. And we would get these, if we start off with no lead in our blood or tissue, we would end up with these two equations here. Um, and these are all being driven. You see we've got constants on the end again because basically we're absorbing, what's that, a one gram of lead uh, per unit of time. Um, so we this 
we create these constants again. Let's have a look at what the graph says going on here. Well, we started off with no um, lead in our blood or in our tissues. And what happened? Well, it increased and it carried on till it stabilized. So it stabilized what we got here, 2.3 kilograms or grams of lead in our bloodstream and 0 0.95 grams in our tissue so and it's going to stay like that the whole time so that's basically poisoning us and that's why we went for unloaded petrol next one then i said it would be interesting to look at covid well, let's have a look at covid so if i've got a population of people they um, we can split them up into different groups susceptible people those are the ones who can catch it yeah infected people well they've caught it and recovered people, well, they're the people who recovered at the end. So I've got three variables, S, I, and that should be an R there, shouldn't it? S, I, and R. And you see this in lots of medicine pandemics, yeah? So what's happening here? Well, number of people who are susceptible is going down because people are getting infected. So I've got a negative sign here. Well, what's happening here? Well, I've got so many susceptible people who might get it, and they're going to bump into so many infected people who could give it to them and here's a transmission rate so 55 percent of the time they're going to get infection okay so the number of susceptible people goes down um, because they've become infected and then of the people who are infected well they've the new ones getting infected and some of the others have recovered so that's going to be reducing the number of people infected so that's going to reduce and of course those people have become recovered so that number is going to increase now these formula are quite complicated because they're not linear so i can't actually solve them um, um, simply but i can put them into geogebra and there's a thing called a numerical solver n solve and you can it will come up with solutions for you and all you need to do is put in initial conditions so let's assume we started off with one percent of the population being infected Nobody's recovered because nobody's had it until now. And therefore, 99% of the people are susceptible to get it. So this is like your people who brought it into the country sort of thing, yeah? The 1%. So let's have a look at what the end solver does with this. So 1% of people are infected here, and loads of people can get it. So what happens is the 99% of people start getting it. So the number of susceptible drops. The number of people who are infected goes up. And after a period of time, some of them start to recover. So they turn into recovered. So the number of people who've got it sort of um, peaks out and starts to go down again. Um, what's interesting on this model is have a look at this where the susceptibles end up. Look, there's a gap here. Uh, what's that saying? Well, saying not everybody got it. They were still susceptible to get it. They didn't actually get infected. That's about... 15 to 20 percent of the population in this model did not get infected therefore you know only what 80 to 85 percent of the people in the population actually got it and recovered um, i haven't included deceased but you could you know split this up and have a third a uh, fourth group couldn't you because you could have uh, susceptible infected recovered and sadly deceased third and have another diagram but you can see once again it came to a nice steady state okay then systems of differential equations so what have we got to do is your page for you to stop the video and copy down what i've written here but as while you're doing that i'm going to take you through so we create our simultaneous equations based on the real life we solve them by creating a differential equation Two variables we're going to have a second order diff so we can do a complementary function and over here we can do a particular integral for whatever's on this side we get our two solutions using our initial conditions and what can we do at the end well we can graph this lot to investigate it can't we and see what's happening and typically we're going to see things go to a steady state or we're going to see them oscillating yeah, over a period of time most things aren't going to oscillate like a spring they're going to go to a steady state or sometimes they could shoot off to something extreme like we saw all the rabbits were eaten by the foxes and then everybody dies because there's no food that sort of thing so you could get a shooting off to extremes yeah but usually you're going to head up you want it to go to a steady state so there you are best of luck